group of us were ordered to Washington. I was at test pilot school. I had graduated. I was flying the F-4, the Phantom II. I was one of the early test pilots, the 13th guy to fly ship number one. Ordered to Washington. And a group of us, about 60 or 70 in this room, and there are two engineers and a shrink, we called him, a psychologist on the stage saying, wouldn't it be nice to get in a capsule on top of a rocket? And I said, no, I didn't want to do that. And they said they're going to have monkeys and chimpanzees. I knew I didn't want to do that. I really was not interested in the program. And I went back to Patuxent after that, and they said they'd get in touch with you. And I talked to some of my peers at the test pilot school and also at the test center. They said, if you want to go higher, farther, and faster, give them some time. Take the test, see what it's like. So we ended up being one of those who, I think there are 30-some of us who went out to Albuquerque and had our physical exams, rather lengthy procedure, and something we didn't like very much, I might add. But it was interesting. Years later, I realized what they were trying to do was get background data to compare what we were like before a flight to what we were like after a flight. And that's why they took all these intricate physical tests. They'd never mentioned that to us. It would have been much more pleasant knowing that, at least. Well, one of the, the, the severest ones was the barium treatment, where you have your whole lower intestine and your stomach literally filled with barium. Then you have to run down this hallway with a white smock on, with the open back, trying to protect your body. That was rather demeaning. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite tests, which didn't bother me, frankly, was a psychological test, where they put us in a soundproof room. It was a desk that I had to sit at. I looked over, and there's a cot off to the right. And hmm, What am I supposed to do? And he said, well, you, you won't see anything. We'll turn the lights out. be all quiet. And, oh, okay. So they closed the door, and I grabbed the pillow, put it on the desk, and I fell asleep. I have no idea whether I was in there for five minutes or five hours. So apparently I passed that test because it was one of those that I thought I was worried about. What's interesting, on my Mercury flight, I fell asleep on the way to the launch pad. On Gordon Cooper's flight, he fell asleep on the launch pad. So it proved that maybe those who could sleep easily were candidates, I'm not sure. It still was something I felt I could get away from. I even today say I worked with NASA, never for NASA. And I always said, I'll stick around as long as I think it's all right. And I think most of us had that same kind of attitude. And the result of it was we had that comfort of saying, I'm not stuck here. I can change my orders if I want to. And I'll, I'll never forget sitting in this office, the seven of us in one office, with what we call large steel desks. We abbreviated that to LSD, and the secretary outside. And also we started looking at each other, hmm, interesting, what, what's, he, what's he, who's he? I had known Shepard briefly before, that's the first guy I knew. And I, I met him while we were skating at a motel, while we were in the selection program. Rather amazing, but the rest of the guys I had not known. And how amazing that bond came to be, unbelievable. Well, we bonded very fast. We knew we were competing with each other. We also knew we had to help each other. And that was probably the significant part. We had what I guess we'd call a sibling rivalry, who wanted the first flight and that kind of thing. But each week we would go off on different missions. I went to Akron, Ohio a lot to help develop what became the spacesuit, which of course is called the full pressure suit. Recently I was talking to Gordon Cooper, and he went to Huntsville, Alabama to look at all the boosters. Redstone, of course, we had th two missions on it. And then uh, the rest of us eventually went to San Diego, where I live now, to look at the atlas being built there. So we, we came back from these trips, each one of us on a Friday. Most of the time we were flying commercially, landed in Washington National, and then commuted down to, drove back down to Langley. And we, on a Friday afternoon, we'd sit there and debrief each other on what we had seen that week completely. Nothing was ever kept from the other guy. You always felt that this was something we all had to learn. We started getting bonded closer and closer and closer. And the interesting part is we were all military test pilots. And I was taught a test pilot is a communicator that goes between pilots and engineers. So we had to wear both hats. And here we were designing our own vehicles. So we were not only test pilots, we were test engineers. It was rather interesting how closely we got involved together but in addition, how closely we became involved with the engineers. And we would go to the plant and get to know the president of the company, McDonald, Mr. Mack, as we call him, John Yardley, Walter Burke, Ralph Generally, all these guys were old buddies. That's going from a mechanic all the way up to the president of the company. We had that kind of access. And that, that's probably what brought it all together, because people never held back. 
And I, I, I learned something from Von Braun quite early, by the way. He said, if you have an office, you should have two things, an open front door, always open, and a back door from which you can escape the room. <laughs> and I like that logic. And we had an open door throughout the space program, throughout the space community. Any company, Coast Guard, Navy, Air Force, just amazing how people would receive us open with open arms, really. The biggest shock I ever had in my life, the seven of us came parading in CCGGSSS. Carpenter, Cooper, Glenn, Grissom, Shira, Shepard, Slayton. Announced to the world that we were, we were looking around, all these people, reporters. The one thing in the movie that writes stuff that was pretty close to reality were these crazy reporters buzzing around with cameras, looked like a bunch of bees descending on us. And then they announced this, and I think one of the, my favorite pictures, I still have it at home, someone asked, which of you would like to have a space flight? And I had two hands up. John Glenn had two hands up. At the very end, where Carpenter came in first, there were three hands up. There's a guy in back of him who was a doctor who put his hand up. Looks like Scott has three hands up in the air. Not many people noticed that in the picture. But from that point on, we uh, began to realize something had happened. We went over to the hill, and we were escorted into... Lyndon Johnson's Senate Majority Leader Office. And with each one of us individually, they brought in a senator and a representative of our home area. They came and they salaamed, like, like people coming to the King of Siam. And what's this all about? I realized what a powerful man Lyndon Johnson was. We left and went out in the Capitol steps, and these crazy representatives and senators were racing around trying to get pictures taken with us. We said, you're the big guys. What do you want pictures of us for? It's amazing, that transition that one day. We had a big surprise one day. Bob Gilruth was the director of the Manned Spacecraft Center, the Space Task Group. It was the Space Task Group in Langley, of course, at that point. Manned Spacecraft Center came somewhat timer in Houston. And Gilruth said, gentlemen, uh, we need to have a peer rating. And we went, what's a peer rating? So it means you have to vote for someone else besides yourself. And years later, I said, Shepard, I made a mistake voting for you. They never asked Al who he voted for, <laughs> but it turned out the result of all that was that Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn were selected as the three who would be involved with the Redstone, Mercury Redstone flights. The other four of us were pretty much shattered, dismayed is probably the way to put it. And Shepard looked around and said, I am that good, but <laughs> we always teased. But uh, Al, of course, had that first flight, and John was his backup. And Gus had the second flight, and John was his backup, so John was kind of wondering what was happening. And somehow or other, John convinced everybody you don't need another Redstone flight, which it was scheduled to have. And John convinced them we should have an orbital flight. And Scott became his backup, Scott Carpenter. And Deke Slayton had the next flight scheduled. And Deke had this heart fibrillation. I was Deke's backup. I was totally shattered when it turned out they gave that second flight, second orbital flight to Scott Carpenter. I was very much annoyed, frankly. It turned out Scott had a lot of time working with John, so he was a, it was the right one. I lucked out. I had a beautiful mission, the one, the third orbital flight. So I have no complaints. And, of course, Gordo was my backup. Al Shepard was Gordo's backup. So we all worked together. Deke, of course, had been grounded all that time. I probably would say that Al would have had the, another Mercury flight or a Gemini flight, the first Gemini flight. It was really surprising. The, the first experience we had was to go to the Cape and see a Polaris a submarine vehicle, uh, surface, uh, below surface to air, blow up. I said, wow, we're going to do something like that? No way. And then we had a redstone that lifted off all of six inches and settled back on the launch pad. And with me watching that was Max Viget, who designed the Mercury spacecraft, Gemini and Apollo, really, the reentry technique, and the, and the escape tower. We watched this thing go, shoo, the escape tower, and Max said, I didn't think it'd go up that fast. I said, I think that was the tower, Max. The spacecraft was going through its own logic. Next thing you know, a drogue parachute came out, and then the main parachute came out. All this is hanging over the side of the spacecraft, sitting on the launch pad. Then the sea diary marker came out. I'll never forget this part of that story, which I love. Von Braun and Kurt Debus were in the blockhouse with Bob Gilruth. And Werner said, uh, Kurt, how are we going to defuel that? I go home and get my rifle. We'll put some holes in it. Bob Gilruth almost had a heart attack. <laughs> So we started gotchas even that early. <laughs> Fun people. We were very dismayed when Yuri Gagarin had that flight in April of 61. I still remember it quite vividly. And we could have flown, we could have flown 
Explorer long before Sputnik. We could have flown Shepard long before Yuri Gagarin. But we weren't aware of the fact that there was that kind of race as far as our potential went. I think that went all the way up through the lunar, lunar program. We were always wondering why, why, why are we working so fast? This, of course, to catch up in the Cold War. It was a battle, no doubt about it. But we, uh, we were very much disappointed that we were not at least up to snuff, and we were not. We were way behind. There's a serious answer and a, and a facetious one. The facetious one, Walter Cronkite always talked about, Wally Schraw lying on his back, looking up at that window into the immenseness of space, thinking of all these millions of parts assembled by the lowest bidder. <laughs> that, that's the facetious one. The real one was, I hope I lift off. If you don't lift off, somebody else will take your flight. Gorda was ready to get in there and take it right away. I think that was the greatest concern any one of us had in Mercury days, even in Gemini days. If you don't get off, someone else is going to take your flight. It was that kind of competition. Well, individually, I'll never forget Dick Slayton wanted rudder pedals. We had barely enough room for our legs in there besides having rudder pedals, so we ended up with a, a sidearm controller. We would have pitch, roll, and yaw. And that was the rudder pedal part. We had to go through great exercises to build up our wrist strength in that if you were in a fully pressurized suit, if the cabin pressure had failed, you had to have enough strength to do yaw and do it precisely. So we, we ended up with very strong right wrists. And I'm left-handed. My right wrist was about another size larger than my left wrist as a result. So Deke had to concede that one. I'll never forget that. John was sort of the instrument panel, and Gus was sort of the individual layout. Interesting enough, Gus was the shortest of the seven, but he had the longest torso. And when Gus went on from Mercury to Gemini, the longest torso designed the length of the seat for Gemini. That's why Tom Stafford was able to fly with me, because Tom was the tallest of the next group. Interesting how the dimensions changed. Uh, I mentioned Gordo earlier, had been involved with the boosters. Uh, we were, and I did the spacesuit and the environment. We were spread out all over the country, but individually, we, it's kind of hard to describe which one was doing one. one another one, I think Shepard was involved with recovery forces with the Navy, and how we knew we needed the Navy to be there, and it was surprising how the U.S. Navy became very much involved. Uh, the result of that, we were pretty proud of our own Navy, Shepard, myself, and of course Carpenter. And Glenn had another had gold wings, so we were pretty well represented. <laughs>